I'm Gilbert Cruz, and this is the Book Review Podcast. We're on the other side of Memorial Day, and the summer stretches out before us. It's time to read. It's time to read by the beach, by the lake, on a hammock in your backyard, or maybe even while you're sitting in Central Park. Here on the podcast, I'm looking forward to having some fun conversations with editors and writers, as well as several interviews with some fantastic authors. Recently, I went down to Princeton University, to the great Firestone Library, to check out an exhibition called Toni Morrison, Sites of Memory, before it closed. Morrison, who died in 2019, was one of the great American writers, a Nobel laureate and a Pulitzer Prize winner. This exhibition, which contained a collection of items from Morrison's archive, was relatively small, but it was pretty amazing. There were early outlines of novels from her day planner, letters from people like Nina Simone, incredible pages that were all burned around the edges because they were saved from a house fire that she had in the early 90s, and there were draft pages of books like her classic Beloved. About a year ago, right after she won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, I spoke to Times contributing critic at large, Salome Shatillet, about Beloved. That conversation, which we recorded for our short series, which subscribers can now find on our new app, New York Times Audio, has never run here on the podcast, and we're doing so now. Perhaps it might inspire you to read or reread the book. Here is Salome Shatillet on Beloved. Salamisha, it's so great to see you. I don't know if you remember, but you recently won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just I'm so excited to be in conversation with you. And yeah, I I, I did. I did. So I'm really excited <laughs> and grateful. <laughs> okay. Beloved by Toni Morrison. You have two copies here. One of them is a paperback and yes. one of them is a hardcover in a baggie. The first is the one that I read in college. Um, and so it's a paperback edition. And then the second copy I brought with me is the first edition of the novel that came out in 1987. And it's signed for Salamisha regards Toni Morrison. So it's signed by Toni Morrison. Mm. Yeah. And the hardcover and the bag is usually on my shelf. You know, there were so many times I'd go to a Toni Morrison reading and I would just never get the book signed. And then she was here in New York at the 92nd Street Y, maybe seven years ago. And I found a first edition copy of Beloved, and then I asked her to sign it. It's really cool because there was like a BBC documentary on her, so they actually captured me talking to her. No way. And I said to her, you're the reason I became a critic. And so she was like, oh, you know, she's like Toni Morrison. So she was like, oh, thank you, you know. <laughs> and so she signed it, and... um it's really kind of beautiful. So anyway, I can, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a crier as a person, but I could probably easily cry about that moment. And the reason it's in a bag is because I also spill water a lot in my bags. I don't usually walk around with things in bags. So I was like, I don't want this to get wet. Like I always have water bottles and things There's like that. There's literally a bottle of water next to it right now <laughs> on the table. Yes, but it's not in my bag. So <laughs> And d- describe the cover. Because I think if, if someone were to buy Beloved Now, there's, I think, vintage re-released uh, paperback copies of, yeah. of The Bluest Eye and, and all her books. And there's a red cover now that the oh. paperback, oh, I actually so I actually have it here. Oh, what? Okay. It just oh, so happens that I, re- yeah. I read it, I reread it last week. Oh, you did? That's out so of the weird. Blue. It oh, is weird. It was fate. It was Toni Morrison bringing us together. Why were you reading this last week? Because you're such a busy schedule. You were like, so, I'm like, I'm going to read Beloved. Uh, you know, I, 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 it was only the second time I read it, I think in my early 20s, right after college. And, and that, that was quite a while ago. And it was in the news, you know, like, a, I can't remember when that Virginia election was, when there was that ad with the parent talking about how she didn't want her son reading Beloved. And mm. I said to myself, I, I just need to get it. So I, I bought it a while ago. It was just been sitting on one of various piles around yeah. my around my home. Yeah. This is what it looks like now. Red cover, sort of a cursive title, but yeah. yours. The copy that I read in college has an image of a, a black woman who in many ways is, is dressed in kind of like late 19th century. So it looks like a suffragist, but she also looks very ghostly. Like her face is very translucent. And it also says 1988 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction on the cover of the one I have, which obviously sure. was not the case when... Um, she wrote the book originally, so. 
So that um, paperback copy there um, says that she won the Pulitzer Prize. She also won the Nobel Prize. Yes. You ostensibly now share the same award <laughs> as the person whose book you've yeah. read so yeah. many times. That is totally normal, of course. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. Yes, it's quite beautiful. And um, yeah, I always think of her with the Nobel. So I actually forgot that she had won the Pulitzer with this until I looked at the cover. Because the Nobel for Morrison to win it was just, it changed everything, right? But yeah, she also won the Pulitzer, which is pretty exciting for a beloved. Just for, if you were to say to someone it changed everything, they, they don't really know the history. Why did her winning the Nobel change everything? She's the first African-American writer to have won the Nobel for literature. Also, obviously, the first Black woman writer to win it. And, you know, Toni Morrison, when we think about her now, she's very much part of the American canon. But, you know, when she emerged, she uh, emerged at a time when Black women writers, and she's part of a, a cadre of them, and Tezake Shange, um, Alice Walker, uh, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, they were actually quite popular in many ways in terms of publication, reception, and and people buying their books, but they also were maligned a lot. Um, there was a critique of their writing as being anti-Black male. There's a famous New York Times review of her novel, Sula, and the critic praises the book on, in terms of prose, but hopes that Morrison one day will get past writing about Black women. It's like one of those moments that bother her. She was both critiqued within um, her community, but also critiqued by mainstream critics. So it wasn't assumed that Toni Morrison's genius would be appreciated and received the way that we now do. Can you tell us what the book is about? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. for those few people who have not read uh, what is an American classic. Yeah, so Beloved is based on a true story of Margaret Garner, who was an African-American woman who escaped slavery, but to prevent her children from being re-enslaved, she kills one of them. And so Morrison takes that gem of a story and turns it into a completely different novel. The main character is Setha, and we find her in freedom, but we also find her in this house. And so can I just say something about the first line as I keep on going. I'll go through the plot. The first line of the book, and Morrison has like really good first lines, but this one is, 124 was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. And so 124 is the house that Setha lives in with her mother-in-law, baby Suggs, and with three of her children because one of them, beloved, or the character Beloved, was murdered earlier. And so we're in this moment in which this mother who has defied the odds, she's escaped slavery, she has children who are born um, or living as free Black people. But there's also this idea that at any moment that that freedom can be taken away. And also the lengths that she goes through, Morrison describes it as thick love, that kind of thick maternal love that will enable you to kill your child. That becomes the kind of conflict of the story. And then there's a character that appears, a woman who we refer to as Beloved. And in the novel, is that a real person? Is that the figment of her imagination? Is that the trauma of slavery returning? And so Beloved both haunts her mother and also has such a voracious appetite that she almost consumes her mother. And so what's Exciting about the novel in a formal structure is that Morrison was really trying to capture, like, how do you tell the story of this national and personal trauma? How do you capture that in prose? And so she plays with, you know, there's different chapters have different points of views and are told from different narrators, but also on the page, when we get to what we think is Beloved's point of view, it's so fascinating because she kind of breaks up the line structure, the words collapse into each other. It's it's just a really magical and magisterial experience. We'll be right back.
Now, let's return to my conversation from last year with Salome Shatillet about the book Beloved by Toni Morrison. So when did you first read this book? And is this the copy that you first read? I think so, because it has my name in it. I read it in college, um, my junior year. And I feel like I read it on my own. My senior year, I decided to do an independent study. I wanted to understand what slave narratives were. Like, I hadn't actually spent a lot of time reading slave narratives outside of Frederick Douglass's, you know, famous slave narrative um, from 1845. And so I spent my senior year doing an independent study, reading slave narratives from 18th century and 19th century. And I wrote a, a major paper on that because Morrison also has this really famous essay called Sight of Slavery. And she talks about writing Beloved, but she's really also looking at the slave narratives that come before her. And then on a personal note, and I'm very public about this, my junior year, I was sexually assaulted on a study abroad program in Kenya. And when I came back to the United States, I entered an a, a experimental program that helped people who were sexual assault survivors who were suffering from PTSD. Part of the process was like you had to tell your story over and over again, because the idea was that the memory of the trauma is almost as visceral as the moment of the trauma. And so I'm experiencing this as a, a patient, and I'm reading these slave narratives, and I'm looking at what Morrison does in her novel, and she's dealing with trauma, and she's moved, going back and forth in time. So I'm actually experiencing this on a personal level, but then I'm reading it. So it's really like a really interesting personal moment to find this novel and then become curious about this idea of returning to the past to understand one's present, right? Like the past is always there. The past is, can be reconciled, it can be reckoned with, or it can haunt you and just keep on interrupting your present. And so Morrison's book, she was in a way forcing the hand of America at that time to come to terms with its past. Can I um, take a step back? You could have been reading many other books at the time that you were reengaging with your own uh, memories of trauma. What did it mean to you to have this one in front of you that sort of directly engaged with this? She uses the word re-memory over yeah. and over again yeah. to be sort of experiencing these things over and over again in one's mind. I also think I was drawn to it because my father's from Trinidad and my mom is African-American. and so. You know, what is actually the point of commonality in terms of their histories? And it's really like as descendants of slaves. And so part of me was like interested in how this horrific long term event of slavery creates a people in the new world. So if you're in Brazil or if you're in Trinidad or if you're in the United States, you kind of have this shared ancestry. And then on a personal level, my sister Shahrazad Tillit, we were very young. And I was in the early stages of my healing from being a sexual assault survivor. She started documenting me. So this is a big part of our, both of our artistic journeys, but also our political journeys. And so we turned it into this multimedia performance called Story of a Rape Survivor. But there's a later poem in the performance. And the name of that poem is, I died and was born on the same day. So when I was writing this poem about finding my soul finding myself again after experiencing sexual violence, I went back to Beloved. There's a scene in the book in which a group of Black women, because Setha is also a very, like, estranged character in her community because she, like, killed her child. So, like, no one really wants to be friends with Setha. No one understands how you could kill your child to avoid slavery. Like, it just seems such an extreme response. And there's a group of Black women who are in her community but have never taken to her, who ultimately save Setha. And in that scene, and I, I'm not trying to give too much away from the plot, but I, that some of that language is what I use at the end of my poem. It was just a beautiful scene. So anyway, so Morrison's just a beloved, obviously, is such a big deal to me. And Morrison is such an important figure to us all. So it's It sounds so intertwined yeah. into your life. It, it really does. Yeah, I think it's a really, I don't know, I, I quote Toni Morrison as much as I can. My sister says I can't do a conversation without quoting Tori Morrison. <laughs> I actually, um, there's a, a, a reference to an interview that she does in my Pulitzer speech. So Tori Morrison is like, you know, she's always with me. What was the reference? 
So I talk about writing about Black women is not a narrow field or a shallow place. You know, because if you grew up as a Black girl in America, Black girls and women live in this kind of slippage space where they're not seen as Black, they're not seen as women. And so for a very long time, I felt like not only my own invisibility as a Black girl, but also having to convince people that this is a community or a people worthy of our investment and worthy of our attention. I feel like we're actually in a really different moment now, which is beautiful, but it's also been hard fought. And so when I read that interview with Toni Morrison, it just it was like to think about it as an expansive place when you've been taught that this is too parochial, too limiting, or too few people can identify with the stories and experiences of Black girls and women. It just It just opens up a lot for me and makes me feel like empowered, but also pretty committed to writing about Black women artists as a liberatory practice of my own. I think I know (laughs) that interview, or at least I know the quote, which Mm -hmm. is, yeah, she was reflecting on people saying, why are you putting yourself in this corner? She said, actually, I I have more experience like most white men, like just being a Black woman in the world. And so when I write about Black women or about Black people, that's huge. Like you can fit so much it's in really that. It's such a beautiful um, response. Anyway, so again, obviously I incorporate as much Toni Morrison in my own work as possible. So how many times, if you had to estimate, do you think you've read Beloved? God, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It feels like, well, I've taught it too. So you always have to reread it when you're teaching it. Um, maybe 20. Huh. And and I want to ask one question about how you've taken the book with you over your life, which is, you now have two wonderful children. (laughs) Yeah. And part of the book, as you said earlier, is about the thick love of motherhood. Mm. So what has it meant to you or how did you take the book differently, if at all, after becoming a mother? I was thinking about this on my my ride here about Black motherhood in this time. You know, African-American motherhood or Black motherhood is is such a fraught experience because you're not only wishing that your children succeed in school or um, have healthy relationships with themselves and with each other and with their friend group, but that you're always like anticipating, you know, what does it mean for, I have a six-year-old boy named Sydney who's cute and wonderful now. And Michael Brown was cute and wonderful when he was a child and you know, you're, you live in this moment where you're appreciating who they are in the moment and you're trying to anticipate the ways in which someone won't be able to see them in the future. How do you prepare children to maintain their humanity and know that what they're going to inherit is a world in which because someone doesn't see their humanity, their lives can be snatched away so easily? That's like a lot for a parent to have to stave off or I I, I compare it to being a shadow boxer. Like you're always kind of like anticipating something and trying to stay present. And so I think with uh, Setha, she knew how horrible slavery was. And she knew because she had her own experiences. One of the formative traumas that she experiences in the book is that her mother is taken away from her. And also at the Sweet Home is the name of the, the plantation, another beautifully ironic uh, title. And she's put on a bed and she's being inspected and they're comparing her to an animal. And this is what she knows slavery to be. And so she will kill her children. There was not a child that she was going to keep that could be returned to slavery. When do you think you will introduce this book to your children, who are both still young, but... Yeah, it's a good <laughs> thought about like the next generation of beloved um (laughs) yeah it's it's i mean i'm sure you struggle with this like talking about slavery is really difficult to do with children because it doesn't make sense i don't know it seems like such a gift to give them beloved maybe in high school i mean you know high school i think do you think you will buy them new copies yes yeah (laughs) they're they're not they're not touching yours no no I mean, there are some things you want to bequeath to the next generation. These are mine. Yes. After all of this, after all I told you, these are my books. (laughs) (laughs) It's just been a real honor to hear you talk about Beloved Salamisha. 
Well, thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to talk about a novel that means so much to me, but also one I haven't written about. So it's been a really lovely conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was my conversation from 2022 with Salome Shatilik, contributing critic at large for The New York Times about the book Beloved. I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of The New York Times Book Review. Thank you for listening.